This is part one of the lecture on chapter seven. And we're going to go through this one very quickly since you've done a lot of work with your cell membrane models. Um, so first of all, just a quick overview with phospholipids. Um, the cell membrane is made up of, of course, phospholipids, which are ampipathic, meaning that they have both a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic end to them. The top head is the hydrophilic portion because of the phosphate group. And then the hydrophobic portion is the hydrocarbon fatty acid tail. And they, of course, are going to be arranged in the bilayer. So we came to understand what the structure of the bilayer um, model of the cell membrane um, through the work of, actually, there were two Dutch scientists in 1925 who actually proposed that there were phospholipid bilayers. But in 1972, Singer and Nicholson, the names that you see on the slide here, are the ones that proposed that there were also membrane proteins inside this phospholipid bilayer and that their hydrophilic regions actually would protrude down into the cytosol of the cell. So this was the beginning of the fluid mosaic model. Um, and the hydrophilic regions of proteins and phospholipids um, are in maximum contact with water. And the hydrophobic regions are in the center, non-aqueous environment between the two layers of the membrane. The role of the plasma membrane um, is first and foremost to separate li the living cell from its surrounding um, aqueous environment. It's very thin. It's about 8 nanometers thick. Um, and it controls traffic in and out of the cell. Um, and what that means is it allows some substances to cross more easily than others. We say it's semi-permeable. The composition of the cell membrane does vary from cell to cell and from organism to organism. Um, and how it varies is um, the different elements that make it up. So first of all, the fat composition can be varied um, depending on where the cell is found. Um, this membrane phospholipid composition um, is important. Um, First of all, the membrane molecules, these fat molecules, are held in place by some weak hydrophobic interactions. But most of the lipids and some of the proteins even drift laterally in a plane of the membrane. Um, but rarely do they flip from one phospholipid to the other. So they stay in the same layer, but they float around and they actually switch positions. So, for example, phospholipids that are next to each other switch positions or locations about 10 to the 7 times per second. So when we're talking about a fluid model, that's exactly what we're talking about. But back to, so that's one way we have the um, variation in the actual composition. But even more, the variation can be specifically the type of um, lipid that is found there and also the presence of cholesterol. So the membrane's fluidity, how fluid it is, is going to be influenced by temperature. So for example, as the temperature gets cooler, membranes will switch from being very fluid to a more solid state. Just like if you have oil and you put it in the refrigerator, it can get a lot less fluid. Um, if you leave it at room temperature, it's very liquid. You put it in the refrigerator, you get this lump, um, kind of semi-solid. It's exactly the same with the cell membrane. Um, so that solid state is because the phospholipids are actually packing down more closely to each other. So if a membrane is rich in unsaturated fatty acids, it's going to be more fluid. 
Um, so remember the unsaturated fatty acid is the one that has the double bonded carbons in it. So it has the kinks in the fatty acid chain so that it is liquid at room temperature. So some membranes are going to have more unsaturated fatty acids than others. Um, if they have a lot of saturated fatty acids, then it's going to be a, a more stiff um, type of membrane. And then we also have, again, the role of the cholesterol. So cholesterol is a steroid, and it is um, wedged between those phospholipid molecules in the plasma membrane in only animal cells. You don't find it in plant cells. Um, and at warm temperatures, like at 37 degrees centigrade, our body temperature, cholesterol will keep the movement of the phospholipids more stable, um, and it reduces the fluidity or the movement of those phospholipids. Um, at cooler temperatures, the cholesterol helps do the opposite. It actually helps maintain the fluidity by preventing a tight packing of the molecules together because it's actually physically separating the phospholipids. So cholesterol plays a big role in maintaining the fluidity um, and also the rigidity of the phospholipid bilayer. So it really is involved in um, kind of stabilizing any tem temperature fluctuations that might affect the cell membrane. Another factor is that many organisms um, that experience different temperatures have actually evolved over time to have adaptations that allow them to change the lipid composition of their cell membranes. So for example, cold adapted organisms, ones that are used to cold, like winter wheat, increase the percentage of their unsaturated phospholipids in the autumn to prevent the membranes from solidifying and stopping any fluid mo movement at all during the winter. Also, where an organism lives um, will determine its phospholipid composition, its lipid particularly composition. So, for example, fish that live in extreme cold will have a higher proportion of unsaturated hydrocarbon tails, or fatty acid tails, which helps those um, fatty acids in the membrane to stay fluid. Or the opposite, um, the membranes of bacteria or archaea that live in hot thermal springs will have unusual lipids that prevent excessive fluidity at high temperatures. And believe it or not, this picture down here is actually um, not touched up. This is the actual way that this particular geyser hot spring looks. This is in Montana. Um, and the way that this, just kind of a side note, the way this has occurred is that um, tourists for decades threw coins into these pools for good luck, but the pools actually. Um, began to block the pool's heat vents and in that way lowering the temperature a bit. Um, and at the same time, um, the temperature of these hot sp springs um, caused chemicals from the coins to leach out and those caused a reaction that made it hospitable for certain bacteria to grow. And those bacteria over time work their way to the water's edge, which is what is making up this yellow ring. It's actually a bacteria that is making up that yellow ring around the blue center, um, which is actually what it originally looked like. And then this green is a transition color between the blue and the yellow. But unbelievably, these um, algae here, um, that are actually a thermophilic bacteria, meaning um, thermophilic meaning they like hot bacteria <clears throat> that can survive the temperature in this hot spring, which even though it is cooled, 
is still um, can be 107 degrees centigrade. So kind of just a interesting side note. So the next concept I want to talk about is that molecules need to pass through this phospholipid bilayer. And that occurs, um, first of all, through diffusion. So the fats and other lipids that are not polar can actually diffuse through a phospholipid bilayer. So we see here lipids can pass through. Um, but very few other things can, not, can actually. So anything with a polar charge like water or any ions like salts, um, ammonia, um, any large molecules like starches or sugars, um, proteins, the amino acids, these are all large mo molecules. None of those actually can get through this layer. The, even though these are fluid, they still are close enough together to not allow certain things, large things, to get through. And they're also, because of their hydrophobic um, properties, um, don't allow anything with a charge or polarity to pass through. So the cell membrane, again, remember that it, one of its major jobs is to be a boundary between the inside and outside or separating the cell from its environment. But at the same time, it does need to get materials in and out. It needs food, carbohydrates, sugars, proteins, amino acids. It needs lipids. It needs salts. It needs gases, um, O2. It needs water. Um, and it also needs to get rid of its waste. Um, it needs to get rid of its CO2. It needs to get rid of water if there's too much. Um, it also needs to ship out products. Um, it needs to get rid of ammonia and maintain a balance of salts. So it may need to also export some salts. So the things that help these larger molecules or these polar molecules to get through the cell membrane are going to be um, protein channels. Um, so if we are actually wanting to use diffusion to move things across the cell membrane, we need a passageway um, to get through the hydrophobic um, composition of the lipid bilayer. And so to do that, um, as you guys again know from your cell models, there are little tunnels made out of protein that are called protein channels that will allow specific materials to cross through. So before we go into um, how those work, the different mo modes of transportation, um, let's go back and revisit the structure of the membrane. So the cell, we've talked about the lipid nature of the cell membrane. Now let's talk about um, the proteins that are embedded and a part of the phospholipid bilayer. So there are um, these channels, and these channels are made out of protein. So that's one of the major um, functions of a protein in the cell membrane. And again, proteins can move um, within the fluid um, bilayer of the cell membrane. So just as the phospholipids are floating along and changing positions, proteins actually can change position as well. So that means these channels can move around in the membrane. And that's an important thing, that, especially as we learn some other concepts later in the term. Um, it becomes really important that these channels can be moved around. Um, and it's believed, actually, that some of those pro proteins are actually um, not just floating in their movement, but they're actually being directed in their movement. Um, and there's belief that maybe that's occurring um, by motor proteins within the cell actually walking the protein that is attached to them um, uh, to a different position in the cell membrane.
So why are proteins so great?